I just wanted, this is actually the four year anniversary. I think next month is the like four year anniversary for this meetup. So I was kind of strolling down uh, memory lane a little bit. Uh, Kimberly was actually, she used to work at PagerDuty, um, which is sort of down the street. Uh, they just IPO'd, right? Yep. So, so Kimberly, uh, she, she cashed in her options and got the hell out of there. <laughs> Uh, joking. Um, so they actually hosted the very, very first meetup, which is this right here. Um, and I think I was talking about Spark After Dark, which was like an old talk that I had a bunch of years ago with a funny name. Um, but yeah, you can see Page of Duty down there. Yeah, 2015. Yeah, July. Um, and I remember that day well because my demo didn't work, right? I, I spent all this time building uh, Spark After Dark for this event and for uh, an upcoming conference and it just completely crashed, so I, I just had to like talk through it. Um, we're up to about 11,000 members, um, 13 group reviews, which I've never read, so if someone wants to read them and tell me about it, that's great. Uh, we have 10 events coming up. Those are mostly like online things. We're still trying to sort out the uh, like in person. Yeah, like obviously this stuff takes um, a uh, rather huge amount of effort to put together and food and all that. Um, I do want to point out we've done 230 events yeah, over those four years. And I think John's probably, yeah, John back there has been to probably 228 of them. Um, so thanks for coming, John. And then, yeah, Kimberly, after six months, had this cake made. Uh, that was pretty funny that I've used you know, quite a bit. Yeah, where'd you get that from? That's right, you don't remember. <laughs> right. It was special. Oh, yeah, and like that one was like NLP, Stanford Core NLP. Wow, crazy. Okay, um, I do want to highlight, I was just speaking with uh, Sunil. There is this workshop coming up on Kubeflow. So if you guys are familiar with Pipeline AI and what uh, Pipeline does, very similar to Kubeflow. In fact, we're, we're pulling in more and more Kubeflow bits into the Pipeline offering. Um, and that's this weekend. Is it down in the... Uh, down in, the there? in San Jose. Oh, yeah, San Jose. That's right. Um, so, yeah, you can either talk to him about it or go sign up. Um, so the agenda, we're going to let you guys speak for a bit, and then we're going to get right into it. So um, we have Francesco, who's right here. He's going to do the Keras talk. Uh, we got Ume from uh, Grammarly, who's right here as well. And then we have Brett. Uh, Brett, are you there? I am here, yes. OK, so yeah, he'll be speaking in a bit. Yeah, there he is. Watching the Blues game here, or whatever, sorry. Oh, yeah. St. Louis. Uh, while we wait, how many of you guys know it by Grammarly? briefly talk about uh, Grammarly. I, I work on the same team with Umaya. Uh, we have a so-called data team here, which is focused on uh, customer product interaction analytics. And uh, we have pretty heavy Spark users. Um, and like, we have lots of data because our products are very intelligent and users like use a lot every day. So a lot of data to analyze and uh, understand how to make product better. And uh, um, just a few more moments. <coughs> All right. Thank you. So, uh, what is Grammarly? Grammarly is a writing assistant that helps you make your communication clear uh, and effective wherever you type. So, we work uh, with your email and messaging tools. We also uh, work with your documents like Google Docs and Atlassian, uh, and we, will, we work with your social media and across your devices from desktop to mobile. Uh, and our mission is to improve lives by improving communication. And here's a little bit about our history. We, the company have, has been around for a while, since uh, 2019. Um, 
around 2010, we launched our web-based theater, first product um, that um, our users loved. At around the time uh, I joined in 2015, uh, we released our um, very popular product browser extension and uh, uh, also switched to freemium model, which allowed us to quickly grow from 1 million to around 2 million users uh, around like, as of now. And uh, along the way, we launched our other hits like desktop application and uh, mobile keyboard. So, yeah, as I mentioned, we uh, have lots of data, uh, a lot of uh, having a lot of fun with Spark. We'll be happy to share our experience and like learn from yours. Please find me and Maya after the talk. Uh, after the talks, we'll be excited to to chat. So, thanks, Maya. Okay, so I'll be talking about custom expressions in Spark and how we utilize uh, expressions in our data pipeline. So my name is Umayyah Abdunabi. I'm a software engineer at Grammarly. I've been here for about three years now and I've been on the data team. So as you saw, we have 20 million daily active users uh, as of now across multiple products. And a lot of data is produced every second and we want to understand it. We want to be able to understand the data we're getting. And to do that, we use NAR, which is our internal data analytics platform. Here's a little like image of how it looks. Uh, and the reason it's called NAR is because, you know, like shredding the NAR when you're like snowboarding or surfing. In our case, we're shredding the data. So the goal of uh, NAR was to understand who our users are, how they interact with the product, and how do they sign up, engage, pay, and how long do they stay? And allow us to make data-driven decisions. And you can see this like an overview of how it is. Like we get all this data, our analytics platform processes it and spits out a report. So it takes all these events, processes it, and gives back a report that users can understand. Users here being uh, internal Grammarly employees who use our product. So here's a run through of how it kind of works. So here a user writes a query. We have an internal SQL-like language we called GQL, which is built on top of uh, Spark SQL. And a user will write like an expression, like a query like this. And that's sent to our backend, which is run Spark and Scala. And it spits out a report that will be sent back to the user via our web UI, web application. So what you just saw there was when users write queries, they use something called expressions. They use expressions to say what they want to do, what they're trying to compute, what they're trying to understand with the data we have. And in the previous query we had, we had uh, two expressions. Here the user is saying that uh, I want all users for the event name where this property foo equals bar and I want to segment the data by browser. So Chrome, Safari, Firefox, we understand, we want to see the amount of users who came from this browser extension by this property. And we're getting hundreds of queries a day. Users are constantly using it. We have power users who are using it to run uh, queries that might be crunching billions of events. So you can see where expressions, how they become important is that the same expression is being run on billions of events and uh, how you optimize expressions will result in uh, latency of getting your results back. And that brings us to expressions and what they are. So to make it simple, here we have a, uh, let's take a SQL query, uh, just a simple select query. And we can see we have three expressions here. <coughs> These three weight, which is basically just a attribute to a column, uh, some uh, expression which takes three columns and does some sort of arithmetic operations and a filter clause where we just filter the events by some uh, greater than clause. So if we take that expression, we want to understand how Spark understands it. It takes your expression, how does it understand it? Basically, it 
red is represented as a tree. So in Thai Spark, you'll realize that a lot of the underlying of Spark SQL is trees. Everything from the expression to the physical plan are all uh, represented via trees. And this stems, a lot of this stems from SQL. And if you look into database theory and a lot of compilers, SQL just stems from a lot of that. So a lot of the stuff Spark is doing has been done in databases and in compilers. So Spark uses trees because they're a nice recursive data structure and they're easy to reason about and easy to understand from the engineer's perspective. And uh, it's the core abstraction in Spark SQL. And it's Spark SQL is built on top of Scala, which is a functional language which allows us to do pattern matching and efficient recursion. So you'll see that throughout Spark SQL, we're using a lot of trees to represent the data. And how the tree is computed, understood is you, for example, let's say we get an input row uh, from a table. Basically, it goes down the tree, traverses down, starts computing the attributes, and then now starts computing the actual expressions until it results in a result. And how this looks like in code, so this is a simplified code. I don't, I don't want it to make it too uh, like complex, so I simplified it down. And if you want to see the real, you can download the Spark uh, source code and just go to the expression library, the expression class. So basically it's a class that is a recursive data structure. So, and the main things you need to understand is that it takes children, which are the, if it has children, like we'll show an example of an expression with children, in an eval, which is how you compute the um, expression. And we'll go into more functions that it has later on. But these are the two main functions, the children, it, children of the expression and how to evaluate the expression. Here's addition, for example. Addition takes two, two children, a left and a right node. So that would be the children. And to evaluate it, you evaluate the left node, and then you evaluate the right node, and the result, you add it together. So basically, expressions are how to generate a value given some input data. You're getting some input columns, and you want to output a value. And Spark SQL uses expressions to build around 300 uh, SQL functions. So if ever, whenever you like min, max, uh, concat, and all these expressions you typically use within your data frames or SQL, uh, are built, are, 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 um, all of them are built with uh, expression, the expression class. Or ex extend expressions or some uh, child uh, inheritor of expressions. <coughs> <coughs> but the issue arises is, so of those 300, what if none of them fits your needs and you need more capability? What if the expression you want isn't available? Hopefully all you can still see. Is that Brett? Oh. Okay. Okay. So, what if the expression we want isn't available? So, the most simple thing you could do is what you're probably familiar with is user defined functions. So, it's the e easy way to add new expressions into Spark. Uh, you write them a general programming language. In the case of Spark, that would be Scala, Java, or uh, Python or R. And here's an example of it. Uh, so let's say the previous example we had where you're doing select and you have the uh, price column and then you have that arithmetic operation. Well, you could um, encapsulate that logic inside of UDF like this and then just use it in your query like this. So they're very simple to use. Uh, one line function and then the next line you can use in your queries. And the UDF function you see here uh, registers it within your Spark session. So you're able to use it right away. But because they're so simple, they come with certain limitations. Yeah. So the first thing is when you're using uh, 
UDFs, you pass a closure, like an anonymous function, into the UDF function. And from the terms of Spark SQL, that uh, prevents it from doing a lot of optimizations. Because of, uh, so because of the, it's a closure, you lack transparency, and there's not much scope for Spark to optimize it. And the thing to know about Spark SQL is that it's a relational library. It was built on top of Spark to add relational and structured programming to Spark. So structure means limitations. It limits what you can do. But with limitations comes optimization. And well, that's where expressions, you understand. Spark SQL understands expressions, understands how they look like and what they do. So it could heavily optimize what they're doing. But when you're passing a UDF, you're passing this closure, which is just a Scala function. And it, Spark SQL doesn't understand what it's doing. There's not much, uh, currently there's no, uh, it doesn't do introspection to see the bytecode of the closure or anything. It just simply treats it like a black box. And along with that, you don't get access to input types. So when you use a UDF, you're using the, the types of the programming language you're writing it in. So for Scala, you're using like int string which aren't the data types of Spark SQL. Spark SQL has its own data types. And when you use UDFs, you don't get access to that. And having access to the input types are very useful uh, when you're writing your expressions because you can make robust code that utilizes the type to make decisions. And based on a type, string type, number type, it can make the correct decision of what computation to do. Uh, Spark SQL data types. And it's hard to have stateful implementation. As you'll see, we'll give an example of it of run, writing an expression that utilizes state to write efficient code and to, in general, to make the code, uh, uh, to programming it easier. But the, generally, you'll notice that when you start to write more and more complex code, you'll start to see the limitations of UDS and the way it suffers. And the limitations aren't just because it's less efficient. Uh, it also deals with stuff like input type, stateful implementation, and doing certain things that uh, you just cannot do in a UDF or are just too complex to do. And to understand why would we would use custom expression, uh, let's, we should understand what optimizations are and why we have, uh, and why expressions are important. And in this case, optimize, what we mean by optimize, optimizations and what an optimizer is, is we want to minimize the amount of work we're doing per row. So we're doing this, computation on billions, maybe trillions of events, and you're doing, you want to minimize the amount of instructions you're doing per row, you want to minimize the amount of IO and the amount of computation you're doing. So because of that, you, you come up with optimizations that try to limit the amount of instructions and networking you're doing. So to start off, let's give an example. So this is a typical thing you'll see in most code bases or even queries, you'll see someone do 60 times 60 times 1,000, which is uh, milliseconds times uh, seconds in a minute times uh, minutes in an hour. Commonly done to get the milliseconds, milliseconds in an hour. Uh, but so we know, how can we reduce the time we spend computing this? It would be kind of bad to do this a billion times if you have like a billion rows, kind of be inefficient to compute 60 times 60 times 1,000 a billion times. What we could do is something called constant folding, which is basically goes and looks for stuff that can be statically evaluated inside your query. So for example, here we have, it goes down the traver traversing down the tree until it gets to the leaf and it notices that uh, for this it, constant folding, it starts from the top, traverses down until it hits the leaves. These are two constant numbers. So what it could do is, oh, I could just evaluate it right away. This is also a constant. There's no need to wait till the we send it over during the when we compile it. We can just do this too, and basically all you're computing now is 3.6 million times uh, the column you're using. So instead of doing that complex operation of three multiplications, now you're just doing one multiplication. And if you wanted to add this to your expression, if you wrote an expression, you would add this uh, function called def uh, foldable equals true, which notifies Spark SQL as it's implementing the, op the optimizations. They'll see that, oh, this expression is foldable. So then it'll apply this optimization. 
and you can't do this with uh, UDFs. If you pass in a UDF, which is all it does is two plus two, it's going to apply that two plus two to the billion rows. It's not going to pre. It's not going to pre-compute it. And here's some. I just ran some simple examples of on my uh, on a what is it? Uh, I'm a M4 X large instance on a container in there. Just a simple basic uh, Spark running instance. And then I show some examples of this is the UDF and this is just a billion rows. You can see in multiple cases, in all cases it's slower. And as your data gets larger and larger, this, these instances can become a query running in like one minute to taking 10 minutes. And optimizations are implemented in Spark SQL. Inside Spark SQL, there's something called Catalyst Optimizer. Um, first, to, to think about, when you think about Spark SQL, you should think of that it takes your data frames, data sets, or SQL expressions, and it's a compiler. You could think of it as a compiler that takes that and outputs an RDD. At the end, once you go through Spark SQL, it outputs an RDD. So basically, you input your SQL data frames, and it runs through multiple phases, like a compiler and outputs your RDD. If we look more into this optimizer phase, it does a bunch of these like resolve logical plan, resolve, uh, optimize, uh, it does a cost-based optimization, it chooses a physical plan, all those stuff. But the one we wanna focus on here is the optimized logical plan. Uh, to give an example of some of the stuff the uh, optimized logical plan does, it mainly does like heuristic optimizations, it doesn't, Spark SQL do, uh, doesn't do much uh, on the logical plan side, which is before it gets to the physical plan, it doesn't do much uh, statistics on which plan to choose, just a like, simple heuristics. Like for example, this, uh, it's called Boolean simplification. So it tries to see if it can uh, compute, answer, it's either you can simplify expressions with the answer can be determined without evaluating both sides. So in this example, true, Okay, so we have a true or in a column. This will always evaluate to true because it's an or expression. So what you could do is just return true and avoid computing, avoid the, avoid the computation altogether. Yeah, uh, other examples are pruning filters. Uh, this would remove filters. So if you do filter this and then you do filter true, for example, it would remove that filter true because it's a redundant filter. And this wouldn't like this wouldn't work with UDFs. If you did like a filter in the inside and you use the UDF, and that UDF all it does is return true, it's still gonna apply that filter to every single uh, uh, input row. But if you used an expression and inside the expression you said true, it's gonna remove that filter completely. Predicate pushdown. So you can think there's two predicate pushdowns. There's predicate pushdown within the query plan where it pushes a filter below something so you don't have to, you reduce the amount of rows you're operating on. So let's say you have, take this column, add a column, or do this computation, then uh, do a filter. What it could do is move that filter, if possible, it can move that filter to the beginning so that you don't, you're you operating on less rows in the further down the lineage of your computation. And this actually works with UDFs. If you had a UDF and you do a filter, it, it can move the predicate within the logical plan. It can move the UDF around to minimize the amount of computation. But what it can't do is it can't push the predicate down to the data source. So for example, with uh, pushing predicate down to the data source, instead of assembling all the records in memory, what you could do is you could push the filter down to the data source so that it removes which evaluates the predicate on a lower level and discards a lot of the data before bringing it back into memory. So for example, with Parquet, if you use a filter, it can push it down to Parquet, so it deals with the filtering. So you get back, instead of like a billion results, you get back 10 megabytes, or actually like 20 results. And here's like a example. This was from the, this is an example of predicate pushdown. These results are from uh, Spark SQL benchmarks. If you go to the Spark library, Spark SQL, inside they have a library with benchmarks. And these are benchmarks of predicate pushdown. So here's an example of uh, if 
let's say your data source doesn't have any null values, so it would return zero rows. Which predicate push down? It can push that filter down and not spend any time bringing it into memory. This is an example of returning one row. And as you can see, once you return 50% of the rows, it starts to reduce the amount of benefit. But you can see the benefit of predicate push down. And you miss all of this if you use UDFs. Another one is simplifying casts. If you're doing unneeded casts, let's say you cast the number to a number, it can remove those casts. And all these optimizations are implemented via rules, uh, which uses pattern matching. Here's an example. Uh, if an expression matches a rule, it applies it. If not, it just skips it. And UDFs aren't expressions. They're scholars, they're closures. They're written in like, for our, in our case, they're scholar functions. And it can't apply many of these optimizations. Here's an example of how a rule is implemented. Constant folding. Takes your plan, takes all, looks at the expressions, if it's a literal, return the literal. If, it's, if the expression is foldable, evaluate it and try to see if you can uh, simplify or fold any parts of it. Uh, here is an example of Boolean simplification. It looks at your expression. If it's your expression is true and something else, it just returns that something else. Uh, here's, if, your ex uh, if your expression is fa false, and something else, it just returns false because false and something is always false. And this brings us to custom expressions. And why, after you know optimizations and know the limitations of UDFs, how can we use custom expressions to overcome these stuff? Uh, so we don't have the limitations of UDFs. We benefit fully from these optimizations we just went through. Uh, we have access to Spark data types. Easy to maintain state. You can specify code generation, we'll, we'll give an example of, which is basically the ability to specify the Java source code that would be evaluated on every import row, rather than going down that eval tree you saw, going down the recursive data structure, which is very time, takes a lot of compute intensive. You can say, use this source code instead. Um, so here's an example of state we have this we made this custom expressions because we uh, wanted to convert uh, timestamp to date and the reason we did this is because calendar after, uh, operations are very slow and you want to minimize the amount you have to call a calendar operation so how we did this is that we use state uh, we maintain state within the expression so in this case we want to return a the input type is a long in STS, so we can specify this input type. So if the expression is given anything that's not a long, we will just uh, fail it. And the date, what we want to return is a date type. And this is where the state is. So we say, uh, this should be, uh, I should, this should be a var, it's not, should not be a bell. But basically you're saying date equals negative one, blah, blah, blah. This is at the beginning of the expression. And then we have our eval function. And as you can see, what we do is we, the, the reason we do this is because our data is monotonously increasing. Our data is like sorted by timestamp. So usually you're looking at like a million events all within the same day. So what you could do is once you, if you get one event and you realize that the previous event was from that same day, you can say, you can avoid the whole computation of computing the SQL date time and just return the result from the previous one. And you could keep doing this until you hit the next day. Once you hit the next day, you can do this computation, but you don't have to do it until the next day arises. So let's say you had, uh, you're computing, typically you'll do like a query on all the events from three days ago. Let's say that's uh, 100 billion events. With this, you're only computing on the partition level, you're only computing that you're only calling this three times. You're not calling it a billion, however amount per, part per uh, partition. Here's an example of a uh, type. So we have a uh, expression which converts the uh, data type we're getting from, that's coming into Spark SQL into a JSON type. So it takes, in the function we take the data type of the row, Spark SQL type, and we evaluate it. And basically what it does 
it looks at what type it is, what type is the input. If the input is a Boolean type, return a uh, JSON Boolean. If the Spark SQL data type is long, do this. If it's a struct, uh, then it does a recursive uh, call and it starts traversing down the struct, applying the right uh, type to the JSON type to the result. So here we're doing something which wouldn't be possible in APF. We're utilizing the Spark SQL data types to make a decision on what computation to do. Here's a simple expression of code generation. Let's say we had addition. Instead of doing that uh, eval where we do left eval, right eval. Uh, so I hope this you guys understand. I try, I try to make this as simple as possible. So basically, within the code generation, you do the code generation of the left node, and you do the code generation of the right node, and you create a Java source that at the end will do the left uh, plus the right. So whenever you see, whenever it's computed for every row, instead of doing that traversal of the tree structure, it's gonna call this uh, Java source, Java source, which can be heavily optimized by the uh, CPU and the Java compiler. So how this looks like is, this was our previous one, left eval plus right eval. And what it would output would be something like this. It would be, I'll put a Java function that would look like this to be price cost and it's basically an imperative function where you don't have to do fun, uh, virtual function calls. The big thing with code generation is that uh, the issue was you're doing multiple uh, function calls which uh, was very expensive in the JVM where you're having to jump to another location, empty the registers, put in the new result, maybe spill to memory. But with this you're just it's all in one place. And here's some examples of so this is, the yellow is expressions without code generation. And this is from the previous result. So the main conclusion was that UDFs are great. Even though we saw the limitations, they're still great. We still benefit from them. They're simple to write. They're not as involved as expressions. When you're running an expression, you might be spending a day or two getting to the nitty gritty details of how you want to do this, how you want to do that, how does this work, how does that work. Uh, and custom expressions are great uh, when performance matters, when you start to do complex operations which require a lower level API. Basically to think of this as UDF is an abstraction on top of expressions. A, U, a UDF is, a, is an expression in itself because it's wrapped within a Scala UDF, which is a extends expression. But what it does, it, it takes your UDF and wraps it within a expression. But when UDFs don't work, what you could do is peel a layer below and go into the API level of what Spark offers you and just go one layer lower and you get uh, expressions. And in our, we use both of them in our data pipeline uh, to solve the complex problems we solve. And we're solving a lot of them all the time and we are hiring. So if you'd like to solve complex problems, uh, come join us. Questions? Our example that you gave at the beginning, um, it wasn't clear about the semantics of the pie. Yeah, but then you had a pie browser. Yeah. Or is it like, Is the, is the buy a filter or is it, is it a um, statement to, to, to order the results? Yeah, it's not a filter. So basically what it's saying is, uh, let's say you have, it takes all the events, so let's say a Chrome event. Yeah. It'll take all the Chrome events and it will, instead of returning like um, the default is just all, you can like segment the data by the browser. So you can say for these a million events, into these different columns. Mm -hmm. So it's, just, it's not filtering anything, it's saying what you want to segment the data by. And what about data that doesn't come from a browser? You, you showed at the beginning that you had other clients as well. Yeah. 
So, so you you would use this expression if you if you if the ex event you were using didn't have a browser, then it would just return null. So let's say you had mobile events. Yeah. Mobile events, you would use a different expression. You would yeah. say like uh, get mobile event by device type. So so it is filtering on the events, just selecting those that come from a browser. And then it's segmenting ones that come from the browser. Uh, no, it's not going to filter. This this would filter it. So if we didn't want, uh, let's say we the event the return type of browser was no, we can say like where browser doesn't equal no, filter uh -huh. out all those events. But the by in itself doesn't do any filtering. The where clause will do the filtering. So if we also we specify the event names we want. So here you would say we would say like segment. Uh, Safari events, Chrome events, this events. So there wouldn't be anything other than browser events. If someone said segment mobile events and then uh, segment it by browser, that query wouldn't make sense. So it would just return like no for the result. It would just return a count of the event. So just in terms of language, I kind of was expecting um, something before the by, like filtered by, ordered by, or anything. Uh -huh. so, but that's that's why I wasn't quite oh, okay, okay. the semantics of that article. Yeah. But okay, I would say uh, maybe we could say that it's not just by; it's like segment by, right? So the whole yeah. query is called segment, where we want to split like a time series data, but we don't want we're not necessarily interested in a single series. You might be interested to see separate several series at a time. Like for example, how do different browsers compare to each other? Right? Yeah. Okay. I yeah, so my question is, so, so how are you storing the event data on packet files on a string? Yeah. So you're storing it in Yeah. So we use Parquet a lot. So my process is equivalent to see a group group file? Uh, yeah. Do I need type checking on the query? Uh, what was it? Type checking. Type checking on the query? Yeah. Um, we have a... Uh, so the, this query, what it, basically what happens is we would write it and we would have like autocomplete and stuff. Um, and then it would be sent back to our backend, we could parse it. If there's anything wrong with the, the semantics of the query, we we'll return like an error. But if you do segment Android event and segment it by browser and Android event doesn't have browser, it's not going to return like an error. So it's going to return the results, but all under null. Do you have like other engines like Presto and Pala, and how would you port those expressions to those engines? Uh, no, we, we only use uh, Spark. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right, another question. So, how do you parser? Like, how do you build it? Java, Python, or so Scala? We built it on top of uh, Spark SQL. Right. So, originally, Spark SQL was built with uh, parser combinators, I believe, with three, they switched to Antler, but we're using parser combinators. So parser combinators is a library from Scala, which allows you to make like uh, nice concise uh, compilers. So we use uh, parser combinators on top of Spark SQL. Okay, any more? Um, and then I would be interested, um, do we have a report generator or graphic layer on top of that? Yeah, we do. Are your customers really interested in the raw data so, that comes as a result of those GQL? Yeah, so this is how our UI looks like. Okay. So like you would write your query here and then it'll output like a result. If we do combined queries, you can like output multiple <laughs> queries at once. Uh, it's kind of like a Zeppelin notebook if you I use Zeppelin. Want, okay. Yeah, we, we had inspiration from Zeppelin, so yeah. we created like our own version, but just added like a bunch of cool features. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you everybody. So next talk will be Okay, so let's see if I can get this working.
Hi everyone, Francesco. <coughs> I'm going to talk to you about uh, TensorFlow 2 and Keras and how basically TensorFlow changes, TensorFlow 2 changes everything, uh, at least for those of us that are used to uh, writing either TensorFlow 1 code or Keras. I'll keep the slides to a minimum and then I'll uh, add some notebooks to share. All these are on a public GitHub repo so you can clone it, do it on your own. Not sure we will have the time to go through all of them, but uh, we'll try. All right, so this is the repo. Um, GitHub.com, zero to deep learning, TF2 underscore Keras. Uh, so go ahead and if you want to follow along, just clone it. Otherwise, you have it there for reference. Uh, two words about me and the company I run. I run a company called the Catalyst Data Science. Uh, we do consulting and training in data science, machine learning, and deep learning. And we run a bootcamp called Zero to Deep Learning. That's a five-day bootcamp, mostly for software engineers who want to jumpstart their machine learning and deep learning ability. So join us. All right. So a couple of assumptions that I actually check. How many of you write machine learning code in the room? Please raise your hand. Okay, how many of you write TensorFlow 1 code? Okay, very few. How many of you write Keras code? How many of you write scikit-learn code? How many of you write uh, Spark ML lib code? Those who have not raised their hands, what machine learning software do you guys use? <laughs> PyTorch, anyone? Okay. So I assume that uh, you were, uh, I see that in the room there are like quite a few people that have uh, written Spar uh, Keras or TensorFlow code before. So I assume you're uh, familiar with those. Uh, actually, let's check this second assumption. Are you curious about TensorFlow 2.0? Yeah, half the room, okay, cool. All right, so this is the lay of the land of two years ago where there is this like, battle of deep learning frameworks. And you have Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, and Berkeley, and a Japanese company and a startup down in the South Bay, all competing for basically who's the best framework. And, and basically, they all do pretty much the same thing, implement neural networks. But you know, jury is out uh, on which framework is the best, and everybody loves it, and something just happened. Um, <laughs> Please, can you put me back to like being yeah, the, the leader? Screen's a little All right, cool. <laughs> so anyways, this is the lay of the land in uh, 2017. And um, some frameworks are easier than others to learn. Some frameworks are more scalable than others. Some frameworks are more powerful in some specific subdomain. However, uh, my, and this is my per very personal opinion, I think in 2019, this battle is actually over and there's only two survivors and it's pretty much TensorFlow 2.0 and PyTorch with Cafe 2. Google and, Google and Facebook. Uh, basically Google and Facebook and the open source communities around those projects. Um, why do I say that? Uh, and again, this is my opinion, so you know, uh, it's okay if you disagree, actually, I'd be very curious to hear your opinion. Um, this is what the commit's uh, history from 2015 to now looks like on GitHub for TensorFlow, and you clearly see there is like an upward trend for TensorFlow and a downward trend for Keras, meaning like how active the project is. Uh, if you compare this with the uh, two main competitors from Microsoft and Amazon, which are CMTK and MXNet, very, very clearly you see like at the time of the battle, 2017, there is like a lot of frenzy and uh, a lot of activity and then basically it dies down. On, at, on the CMTK side, it dies down completely. On the M MXNet, does not die down and that's mainly because MXNet became an Apache project. And so the Apache Foundation keeps it up, but definitely it's not as active as uh, TensorFlow. Uh, so basically these two, my opinion, are like not a good choice. Uh, PyTorch, really active. So great project and a very uh, vibrant community, uh, loved by researchers. Um, it's very flexible. So, uh, and it's very nimble in the way that it integrates with Python. So if you're a Python programmer, it allows you to uh, have a more natural coding style than TensorFlow does. 
cafe, uh, again, like pretty much nothing going on there. So cafe is gone. And um, yeah, and one note about, I was discussing with a PyTorch core, core dev uh, the other day, and I was like, what's your opinion on uh, the difference between TensorFlow 2 and PyTorch? And he was like, well, they're pretty much the same. It's almost as if one copied the other. And obviously he was hinting at the fact that, you know, PyTorch came first and then TensorFlow 2.0 came after. But yeah, basically the, the whole ecosystem kind of converged to a simple, way of doing things. And I have a couple of words uh, about Keras as well. I am uh, one of the early day users of Keras. I've loved it from the day one, and I think it's a great framework. And these were my two main reasons to love Keras about all the other frameworks. It has a simple API, and it supported multiple backends. You could uh, switch from Piano to TensorFlow to CNTK to MXNet. And so even as a trainer, it makes it very easy to justify when you go into a company and say, learn Keras, because if you then want to use it with a different backend, you, you can, and you're not tied to a uh, specific, there is no vendor lock. But, but the problem is if uh, the guy who invented Keras works for Google one. Exactly. Uh, so that's one uh, evident problem. And uh, I'd say more on the technical side is that um, the API, of Keras has been adopted as the default API of TensorFlow 2.0, yeah. which makes it basically redundant. And the, multi, the all the other backends basically stop supporting Keras, either because the project died or because, uh, well, basically because the project died. So the multiple backend is not relevant any longer either. So, uh, in 2019, I actually think it's preferable to use TensorFlow.Keras rather than the open source Keras because it has a better integration with the uh, TensorFlow ecosystem and it supports uh, hardware that the open source version doesn't. So that's the way it is. And it does have uh, a vendor lock-in to Google, you know, a byte TensorFlow being uh, open source. There is a little bit of that. But I think the, the pros overcome the cons as of right now. And uh, yeah, learn PF2.0 and Python. That's as much uh, about the slides. I want to comment a little bit about uh, the what's new in 2.0. Uh, it was announced in uh, 2018 uh, August in the mailing list. And then uh, the alpha was released in March, so a couple months ago at the, the, the Dev Summit. What I like about it is that it kind of finally now makes sense. If you're familiar with the, the architecture of TensorFlow, it was like basically a junk of uh, different components or speech together and some maybe three, four ways of doing the same thing and achieving the same goal and never knowing which one is the right thing and the documentation sucks. So it was a big problem and basically I have to say they did a very good job of listening to the community and coming up with amazing documentation for 2.0 and a rationalization of how we do things in TensorFlow. So there is a unified data input layer where you can basically inject data from, from multiple sources, any size basically. Uh, there is a unified, uh, almost unified uh, model building Interface, Keras is the primary API. TensorFlow Hub is basically pre-trained models where you can uh, download models and use them. Estimators, if you're familiar with them, they were like the scikit-learn equivalent of a one-stop shop where you have a class that does like neural net and you just instantiate that class and, and uh, you're ready to go. They survive they have been cleaned up and there is discussion about re-implementing them as Keras models as well. They're not yet implemented as Keras models, but there is discussion going on. So I think actually these two are, are eventually going to converge. Big uh, cool thing is the distribution strategy. One of the pain points in TensorFlow 1 
was how do you distribute your um, model across multiple GPUs, multiple servers, and like how do you train very large models? Um, TensorFlow cluster, which was the uh, official way of doing it, was a nightmare to use. There's a package from Uber called Horovod, which allows you to do it very easily. But basically, in TensorFlow 2, uh, this is achieved with a, a simple context setter in Python. So you decide what distribution strategy you want to use, and then you create the model within the distribution strategy, and TensorFlow takes care of uh, distributing it. And you can distribute uh, across a variety of hardware. The other big innovation is that the saved model is a unified uh, place where you serialize the model wherever it comes from, and then from here you can deploy to different platforms. So you can deploy to the cloud, to JavaScript, to uh, uh, mobile with TensorFlow Lite, or uh, to pipeline or uh, any other uh, interfaces. So to me, this looks a lot simpler and more rational, and uh, I like it. Again, personal opinion. Cool. So I want to uh, show you how things are done in code. So we're going to do a lab. Um, before I do that, I just want to say that this is the website for the bootcamp, bootcamp.02deeplearning.com. And just go check it out. And if you're... Can you go back to the slide? Yes, it's bootcamp.02deeplearning.com. I'll post it in the comments on the meetup anyway. Um, and it's actually mentioned as one of the meetups uh, in the... So thanks to Chris and the meetup for being friends and hosting us. That's always... Uh, a pleasure. All right, so let me open in the repo we have. Where is it? Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is the the, the repo. Okay. And uh, instructions are provided. Uh, there are also slides for a longer talk I gave on the topic uh, at the DSC conference. But basically, to get up and running, you just git clone the repo and then uh, cd into the folder, create an environment which has TensorFlow 2 that's using Anaconda, and then just activate the environment and launch Jupyter Notebook. That's pretty standard if you do that any data science work. So I assume all of you are familiar with this workflow, but if not, just follow the steps and it should be easy. Okay, so notebook number one. The first big thing in TensorFlow 2 is uh, that they enable eager execution by default. Can you zoom in? Yes, I can zoom in. Thank you for asking. Uh, is that better? Cool. All right. So uh, I'm importing a bunch of libraries here, but the, the main thing I want to say is like uh, eager mode, which I, is actually not new. It's been there since 1.5, uh, um, I think. Um, it's enabled by default. And that's a big change because this is what happens if you create a tensor and execute the operator, uh, a TensorFlow operator, like for example, matrix multiplication. What you see here is the result, the intuitive result of multiplying this matrix by itself, which if you've ever written any TensorFlow code, that's completely different from standard TensorFlow behavior because normally what would happen is when you create, when you write this line, this would create uh, a DAG in the, like an operation in the TensorFlow graph. And it's like Spark, like the talk we had from Maya, you have basically created some nodes in the tree, but that you then need to open a session and pipe the data through the tree to calculate the result. Which is really cumbersome, especially if you want to debug. It's great for doing distributed computation on millions of data points, but when you're still prototyping your code, it's actually not the right way of doing things. Whereas this brings back a more natural flow where you just get the result 
that uh, that you would expect from so the result is calculated right away, which is uh, useful, and you can also convert it to a NumPy array. And this is very 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 much like the PyTorch interface, where you have a PyTorch tensor, and if you do tensor dot NumPy, it uh, gives you back the NumPy array. So let's play with it and build the model using Keras. First of all, as any uh, data science 101 uh, tutorial, I generate some fake data. This is uh, uh, called the Moons data set. It's basically two uh, uh, components. And the interesting thing is that you cannot separate them with a straight line. So the whole thing here is a simple model like a logistic regression will not work because they can only draw a straight line. You will need to have a, a deep neural network with some layers at least in order to separate them. All right, so we define a model and this is pretty much Keras, okay? The only difference is that when I imported the sequential and the dense layer, I imported them from tensorflow.keras instead of from Keras. But everything else is exactly the same. Um, you may not be familiar with this way of defining the model where you use a list of layers in the sequential initializer instead of doing sequential empty and then model.add. That was the original way of doing this, but it's the same. I'm defining a model here with um, a dense layer with eight uh, nodes and two inputs, the two features, uh, and a tanh activation function. Then a second layer with two nodes and a third layer, which is the output layer with one node and a sigmoid activation. Okay, so this is like a simple three-layer neural net. Compilation is the same as in original Keras. You compile the model. Compiling the model, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it means you specify what the objective function of the model is, the loss, and what the optimizer is. So you tell basically to the model what being a good model means and how is it going to get to being a good model. Okay, so that's the optimizer and the loss. Uh, one important thing about TensorFlow 2.0 is that the optimizers and the losses have been unified between TensorFlow and Keras. So there is no more duplication of the same thing, which was, for example, Adam Optimizer or Binary Cross Entropy, which you had an implementation in Keras and a separate implementation in TensorFlow. This has been unified. And so you can, this is great because now you can mix and match. You can take a Keras model and train it as an estimator and vice versa. The other thing that comes from, that stems from eager execution is that model now behaves like a function. This is different from Keras open source. In Keras open source, you need to call model.predict and Keras will take the data and pipe it through the DAG opening a session and give you the result. Now, since we are in eager mode, model is a function and so model open paren data will give you out the output of the model, which is great because you can debug more easily. Why? Let's redefine the model using the functional API. Raise your hand if you've seen the functional API before. Okay, not many of you, so I'll go, I'll go slow here. So Keras has a different way of uh, defining models called the functional API. This is the exact same model we had before. Let me make it a little bigger here. So this is the exact same model we had before. However, instead of defining it as a stack of layer, as a list of layers, we define for each layer what's the input and what's the output, and we connect them as functions. So we have an initial input, then the first layer, which takes the input and returns a certain output. Then we pipe this output as the input of the next layer, and then we keep doing this until we get to the outs. And here, notice what I'm doing. I'm defining two models. Model one takes the inputs as inputs and the outputs as outputs. And model two takes the same inputs but outputs one layer early. 
So this two dimensional inner layer just before the output. Why am I doing this? We'll see it in a second. So ignore model two for now. Model one is the model, is the equivalent of this model. I compile this model, again, defining the algorithm for optimization and the loss. And then this time I fit the model on my data. So model.fit works pretty much like in, in Keras. The model is being trained. And so model one applied to the data gives me an output tensor like I expect. However, since model two is between the two tensors and we are in eager mode, I can, without having compiled nor fit model two, I can execute model two and model two will actually use the same weights from the train model one. So they share the weights and I can look at what my data looks like X from the perspective of, where is it? Of this layer here, the second to last layer. And that's interesting because what you see is that just before the classification happens, the network has learned to represent my data in such a way that is now easy to separate with a straight line, actually, probably something somewhere like this. Okay. That's without having to rewrite everything. And that's without having to rewrite anything. I just had defined a second auxiliary model between the inputs and outputs that I cared about. And I trained the first one, and the second one is basically just an inspection door in the first model, which you could do in Keras using the kernel function between tensors, but it was really weird code and not, not standard at all. And now this is basically very intuitive. Okay, I hope. Cool. Uh, the fact that now Keras is part of TensorFlow makes it so that I can mix and match code from the two, the two APIs. So here I'm defining a custom model that inherits from the Keras model class and has three layers that are dense layers. And this is uh, what happens when I call the model. So it will actually do the forward propagation, same functional API as before. However, if here I wanted to implement a layer, I could do, that, do so and like inherit from the Keras layers class and use custom layer, which sometimes you have to do. And now I can uh, use the optimizer and the loss to actually work on the data itself. So for example, I apply model three on my data, I get the logits. Notice that my model doesn't have an activation function at the end. So what I get out of this uh, in this last layer are these uh, logits, so-called, so before the activation function. And I can pass the logits and the labels to the loss and actually get the value of the loss. Okay, so why is this useful? Because if your model is not learning, what you want to do is inspect, for example, the gradients or inspect what's happening inside the model and, and see if you can tweak it in a way that it tilts it towards learning. And so you can calculate the gradients also very, very easily. This is uh, also eager execution, basically what you do is you calculate the outputs of your model and the loss within a context called the gradient tape. They give it this name because the idea is you're recording the calculation on a tape and then you rewind the tape to calculate the gradients. That's basically what's happening. So you calculate the loss here and then you say tape.gradient of the loss with respect to the model variable. And this gives you the gradients and you can inspect them and see, oh, okay, at this layer, they're all zero. We need to do something about this layer. So um, I'll talk about this in a second. So take it as uh, for granted uh, for now. What you can do is uh, do a manual training loop where you, instead of running model.fit, you iterate 
over batches manually like you would do in TensorFlow. But here you are generating the batches, calculating the uh, loss through the model, and then applying the gradients with the optimizer and accumulating accuracy and loss and so on. So basically, the, the high-level Keras API and the low-level TensorFlow API are now connected and you can continuously shift from one to the other and back, depending on what's your, what your needs are, which I find pretty useful and uh, interesting. Okay, so that's uh, model trained manual. What are the other things that we can do in TensorFlow 2 and eager mode? One of the most interesting things is that you can do now things like models with uh, flow control. Because you don't have the graph that is created beforehand and then you flow data through the graph, you can have dynamic graphs, that uh, the dynamic calculation within the model. So if you did this in TensorFlow 1, this would result in an error because it doesn't know, there is an if else clause that doesn't know which branch is gonna be, it's gonna be needed. And you can bundle uh, functions like this into what's called a TensorFlow function, which will evaluate like a Python function. So that's great. Um, the second part of this lab is uh, what happens if you disable eager execution. I actually want to skip it and go to lab number two because I think there is something that's more interesting for this audience. But I just want to mention that uh, if you uh, use, <coughs> if you install TensorFlow to Alpha, there is a whole version of TensorFlow 1 available as tf.compat.v1. So if you want to have an environment with TensorFlow 2 and, and use your code, the trick is to just do the following. Instead of doing import TensorFlow STF, what you do is import TensorFlow compat v1 as yeah. And, and if you do this, you basically have access to the old version of TensorFlow. And so all your code should still work with one major exception, which is the contrib submodule, which has been branched out to a separate repo. And so if you have code coming from contrib, then you will have to deal with it. Don't worry, there are uh, scripts that allow you to go from one to two. So it's actually not, uh, not too tragic. All right, um, <clears throat> let me open lab number two. So two. Okay. All right. Um, another big thing that came with TensorFlow uh, recently, and it's been made default in TensorFlow two, is the TF data submodule, which is a unified data pipeline. And I think it's relevant to, Ker to Keras users to learn to use it because it has a lot of similarities with the generator interface. And so you find you have two ways of doing the same thing and it's actually good to know both of them. So let's say we have uh, some image data here. I'm loading the Cypher data set. So we have uh, 50,000 images and 50,000 labels. And these are labeled from zero to nine, 10 classes, common objects like a truck or a car and so on. And we want to classify them. So what you would do in uh, uh, Keras, you would uh, create um, a model. In this case, I'm creating a very simple model that doesn't even have convolutions, uh, just to run it faster and then use the image data generator to flow these images through the model with the function fit generator. And if you've never seen this, let me walk you through what it is. So basically you create an instance of this class image data generator 
which can do many things. Here, the only thing I'm doing is rescaling the pixels so that they become floats zero to one. But you could also use it for data augmentation. So like rotations and shifts and uh, uh, rescaling of sort, zoom in and out, etc. And then this is a Python generator. So you can use it to flow data batches, basically, from uh, tensors. X-train and Y-train, in this case, are the two tensors. And I'm flowing batches of 256 images and 256 labels. I'm shuffling them. And then this is a Python generator. So I can just call next to get a batch of images and labels, which look like this. And I can run the model fit generator on the data generator to train it on, on the images. This is useful not so much when you have a data set that fits in memory, but when you have data on your, on your computer and you want to flow data from the file system. Because instead of doing uh, data gen flow here, you can do uh, flow from directory or from data frame. And this will flow the images from the file system, which is great because uh, you can basically have as many images as you want, even many more than fit in memory and, and just flow them in batches. TensorFlow has a similar way of achieving the same result through the dataset API. And this is similar, I know there are Spark users. This is, this is very similar to the Spark dataset, uh, data frames um, API. You basically create a data set from something and you have from tensor slices, but you can also create uh, from uh, other things. Uh, there is a text data set. Um, there is text line data set, there is a TF record data set, and in the experimental module, there is the CSV um, experimental. There is a CSV data set, which I find quite useful. So, um, however, you create the data set, this basically is a pointer to the location of your data. And then you can apply functions to it. So for example, here I'm applying the rescale function, which rescales the data and returns the labels as they are. Then I shuffle the data set. I repeat the data set indefinitely, which basically is the equivalent of having a box. And then I uh, apply batching of 256. And what I have here at the end of this procedure is basically a batch generator, but instead of using the Keras API, I'm using the TensorFlow API. Now, why would I do that? Uh, for images, I completely agree, it doesn't make much sense, especially because the advantages given <laughs> from the image data generator are that you can do all of these data augmentation functions for free, and they're already implemented for you. So for images, there is not much advantage, but what if you have log files? What if you have uh, sequences of uh, numbers? What if you have parquet files or any other, uh, or TF records, any other uh, non-image type of data and you have uh, big, big data size uh, terabytes of on your uh, cloud storage? Then in that case, this is amazing because it works naturally with those. You can point it to the, to the folder and say, hey, create a data set from this folder and it will just then uh, uh, treat it as a single data set from which to generate data and you can apply any function. So if you have a parsing function that is very special and specific to your type of data, you can just have, this is basically the equivalent of the UDF that we were discussed, that Maya was discussing before. You can define any function that works on your data and just map it on the whole data set and generate batches from it. And then you can either do what I did in, mod, in lab one, which was a loop. So for I data labels in enumerate data set take a thousand. So I'm taking a thousand batches here and generating batches from them. Or much more simply, you just run model.fit data set um, step and epochs and steps per epoch. So those are 
two different ways of doing the same thing. There are two more labs that I invite you to uh, try. I think I'll stop here for now. And if you have any questions, I'm actually happy to answer them. And uh, otherwise, thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. Um, I know that you talked about like what are the, the pros of this merging between Keras and TensorFlow. But yeah. what are like some of the most common pitfalls of having this? Yeah. Situation? To me, the biggest pitfall is that the Keras project, the open source Keras project, which now basically is an API, an open source API specification that TensorFlow ends up implementing, uh, comes out weaker because it used to be an API specification that supported multiple backends, mm -hmm. and now it's very clearly a part of the TensorFlow framework. Mm -hmm. And so um, if I look forward of like what's gonna happen a year from now, I don't see very much a reason for the Keras open source project to exist independently of TensorFlow. It's dying out. Yeah, so that's to me the main drawback. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say that's the, the biggest. Yes. Yes, I'm not super familiar with uh, they they at the Dev Summit they had a lot of talks about light and I think they have uh, made it even easier to deploy. I actually am not super familiar with that part of the deployment stack, so uh, I would know the specifics of what. Uh, there is definitely a strong effort on TensorFlow.js and given by the amount of, um, of uh, projects that they were demoing light application, I think that there is a lot of interest in light and making it even easier to deploy. I don't know the specifics of it. Um, an interesting project uh, that is uh, on a separate repo but uh, connects to that is called uh, Federated, the Federated TensorFlow. And it's basically an extension of Lite where you can deploy a model and do federated learning, which means every model on every device learns a little bit and without transferring the data back to, uh, to the cloud, you actually transfer just the weights and you learn from all of your users maintaining perfect privacy. So I actually think this would be very relevant to Grammarly because you can do device to cloud, but the data never leaves the device. And so the, the weights, the, the, mod, the train model that learned locally gets back, gets factioned back and shipped to mothership. And you then merge all of the learnings from your you know, means of users and then ship to all of them a new version of the model but the data from the user has, has never left the, the device. Yeah. Has the full documentation for open source development been released, or specifically to know if what if there's anything that's linked with player or any functions that change their name going from one to two? Yes, there is a ton of functions that have, that change their name. Let me share my screen again. Um, there is a lot of rearrangements and uh, there is quite a good uh, uh, explanation in the TensorFlow doc. Um, the go-to place for uh, this is uh, here. If you do, do TensorFlow org uh, slash alpha, that's basically where all of the TensorFlow 2 stuff is, and there is uh, the first two articles, the effective TensorFlow 2 and the how to migrate, document all that, like how the API is changed. Basically, there is a, quite a bit of rationalization in terms of like, for example, math functions, they go into a submodule called math, and optimizers have been unified and duplicated, things like that. And the conversion script, uh, there is an upgrade script that you, you give your old code and it will try to automatically change it and if it doesn't succeed it will tell you like these functions i didn't know what to do so you're not i have to say like the doc is actually very good now it having been you know 
scouring their dog for years, it's actually a quantum improvement, a quantum leap from the old documentation, which was basically really, really bad. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you, guys. All right. So Brett's going to share his screen. I think we got it. I'll turn this up. Yeah, Brett, can you unmute yourself? So Zoom, I think we have them. Hello? Hello? Oh, there we go. Hello, world. Oh. Hello. 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 Brett, can you hear us? Uh, hello. Do you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear us? Yeah. 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 Here you are. Okay. How's my audio? Is this good? Yeah, it's good. Okay, okay. Uh, well, so Brett literally moved to Missouri like in the time that we planned this to today. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It would be fun to be out there with you all. But, uh, uh, yeah. You know, try to do this remotely. So here we go. Uh, good. Okay. Okay. Um, about a year ago, uh, they had the Stanford uh, Dom Bench competition. In other words, broadly speaking, like two computer vision problems, and then a NLP problem. Um, and so the at the time, I kind of wanted to work on the NLP part, but um, I didn't really have the, the, the time and resources to go after it. Um, and then late last summer, they decided to start allowing people to, um, they decided to have like rolling submissions so people could resubmit new results. So I, I started working on this problem again. Um, historically, I've done like a lot of uh, computer vision stuff and I've not done a ton of NLP. So I, um, this is kind of like a good problem for me to really uh, go deep into NLP, so it's kind of new territory for me. And so as a result, I've learned like uh, way too much about this squad problem, we'll say. So I thought I would just sort of share, um, you know, some of the stuff I've learned as sort of a jumping off point for anybody else who's interested in uh, this field. Uh, so at a high level, uh, we'll, we'll uh, look at the squad problem itself. Uh, we'll look at the seek-to-seek uh, -seek paper, which I think is the basis of most of these approaches. Uh, we'll look at four different uh, methods of solving the squad problem. And uh, each of them was the state of the art at some point in time or another. So we'll sort of look at uh, how each one works and what makes them different. Uh, from there, we'll jump over to look at the uh, version two of the squad data set, which is a very hot modern um, uh, area of NLP research, so a whole bunch of people competing on this. And then we'll sort of look at the stuff that builds up to the BERT paper, which came out last fall, um, which is, I would say, pretty close to the current state of the art for this field. And then uh, at the end, I'll try to leave you with some new next steps and where to go from here. So the squad problem, uh, it's quite simply just an acronym for Stanford Question QA Answer Dataset. Um, and so the basic idea is they have a large collection of Wikipedia articles with questions that are associated. And then you're supposed to identify the span of data that is the answer of the results. 
Um, so right here at the bottom of the screen is just an example of what a, a Wikipedia article would look like, what a question would look like. In an ideal, your engine is supposed to identify this 32 portion of the uh, answer. Uh, there's about 100,000 questions in this data set. And the human F1 score, we'll say, um, is about 91% or so. Um, okay. So, seek to seek. Uh, this is an older paper, but I think it's the basis of a lot of modern uh, NLP approaches. So, I thought it was worth just looking at. Um, the key idea is that we combine both our input and our output as our input, and then we um, tie it together to the contextual answer. So um, the, the classical example of this would be like a translation. So we take like a sentence in one language, uh, combine it with its uh, pair in another language, and then try to train our neural network to recognize the, uh, the, the result that we're looking for in the other language. Um, there's a couple different ways of thinking about this, but I, I like to think of it as like basically a data augmentation technique, we'll say almost, whereby we're giving the machine more data so that it can make it easier for it to learn like the right results. Um, to continue this though, um, when people think of the seek to seek, usually it's sort of in the context of inputs, we'll say, but you can also think of each of these A, B, and C and W, X, Y, Z outputs as being an entirely different input. We might concatenate several different inputs together in order to produce our end result. I think if you think about it like this, and then say you look at uh, the bi-directional uh, attention flow paper, which was one of the first uh, um, state-of-the-art approaches to the squad problem, uh, I think you can see the same basic idea. So if you look down here at the bottom, you can see a combination of different uh, word embedding layers. So they have like two different word embeddings, so to speak. One for uh, you know using the traditional love uh, word embedding ve vectors. And then they also trained a second one on the raw character data. So they used a char CNN. Um, they combine these two results as their context. Sorry. And then they combine them with the query or the question, the result they're looking for. Uh, they run it through an attention model and then this bi-directional LSTM in order to produce the final output. Um, uh, this is one of the, this is a, bit, a little bit older approach, but it's kind of the same concept as the basis of the other approaches we're going to look at here. Um, the next one we'll look at is uh, DRQA. Uh, this is a paper out of Facebook from a couple years ago. Um, I would say the crucial difference between this one and the, the BIDAF, the BIDAF, is that um, we're adding one more input layer, which is the document metadata itself. This means that then the attention network at the end, sort of, it has a context of the right Wikipedia articles to be looking into. And this by extension, improves the results. Um, this particular slide is from a different paper um, that I was looking at. But what I liked about this is they compared and contrast the uh, BIDF that's on the left here with the DRQA models. And basically, um, the DRQA is a little bit simpler and, uh, but, but actually produces better results. If you take this idea of adding more data to the model, to its logical conclusion, then we might literally add, say, a half dozen layers worth of potential information sources and then use the neural network to try and make sense of it all. So this is FusionNet. This is actually an older paper. It's from 2016. But they utilize this approach in order to uh, produce even better results than the two models I've shown you so far. Um, the problem with this is that basically we're adding so much data to our network that 
um, the end result is starting to go pretty slow. So then what's interesting is the FusionNet people added on top this uh, simple recurrent unit. Um, if you're familiar with RNNs and unrolling RNNs, I would think of this model basically as conceptually unrolling the RNN into something kind of like a CNN style approach. Uh, the practical upshot of this then is that they have something they can train much faster and simpler than the uh, traditional bi-directional LSTM approach. Um, and then if we take this idea and go one step further, we might build an entire full-blown CNN style residual block approach for our data. Um, this is basically how QA networks. This is a paper out of Google from last year, um, May or so of last year, 2018. Um, I would argue that the CNN approach isn't as uh, powerful at detecting as the LSTM approach, but because it's a CNN approach, it can be made bigger. So basically, this model can be made much larger than the LSTM approaches we've been seeing before. And as you'll see here in a second, that allows it to scale up and produce even, even better results. So, um, here's the Don Bench leaderboard as of the start of last month. Uh, what we can see here is all these different approaches I've shown you. Um, each one, um, was at one point or another uh, the state of the art in this field. Um, on the left side here, what I have is basically what under perfect conditions these networks were trained to roughly. So the BIDAF will get up to around 76% if you give it a significant amount of CPU time. DRQA can get up around 78% uh, for an F1 score. Uh, the fusion net plus the SRU approach uh, does even better at around 82%. And then finally, QA net can be trained up to around uh, 84% uh, for uh, the squad problem. Um, so then I'll have you look over here at the third column over. So this is the time that each approach is taking. So the original BIDAF approach uh, running uh, old K80 took about eight hours to run. TRQA is roughly an order of magnitude simpler. It runs somewhere around an hour. Um, the official Google Net, Google submission for QA Net is 45 minutes. Uh, we'll come back to that one here in a second. And then last month, the Fast Fusion Net, or Fusion Net plus SRU, which they labeled Fast Fusion Net, was able to produce uh, a 0.75 F1 score in under 20 minutes. Um, so I tended to get each of these running for you. Uh, BIDAF, all the code for that was like PyTorch 0.3 era stuff. And then we relied on older versions of CUDA. So I tried to bang on that for a while. I didn't have much work. Um, I'll demo the DRQA running on a T4. Uh, the exact same machine, that's the uh, fourth place result up here. Um, I attempted to get the Fusion Net and SRU work code working, but I had some difficulties with that. And then we'll also demo QA Net running on a TPU here. So let me escape out for a second. Okay, um, I'm VPNed into my uh, Linux box. Uh, this is my DRQA box uh, running right here. So we'll just fire it off. Oops, sorry. All right, now we'll come back to this one in a second. Um, um, we're going to run the QA net on a TPU. So I spun up the TPU earlier. 
Uh, that command looks like this right here. Uh, this is what the actual code to run the TPU job looks like. Um, the QA net's a little bit weird, but basically I have to have one, uh, one process running the evaluation loop. So that's this command right here. And then I have a second process that's gonna be running the actual uh, training of the QA net. So if we go right here, okay, so we'll fire up the uh, evaluation script right here. Uh, so now it's basically running and waiting. Uh, we'll remember this number right here, three minutes and 14 seconds. We'll come back to the, or sorry, three hours and 14 seconds, 14 minutes. And then right here, we'll run the actual QA net training code. Uh, and then we're also gonna run it with just one epoch. So um, it'll get going right here. And here we go. Okay, let's save this time right here, just as a checkpoint. So at uh, three hours, 15 minutes, we started this job. Um, okay, so now we'll look at uh, uh, the, the second generation of squad. Um, the problem with the squad basically is that um, these neural networks overfit to the results, we'll say. So what happens is that uh, basically you can give it a adversarial question and the network will find answers that are basically nonsensical. So for the squad V2 of the data set, what they did is added 50,000 human generated questions that are designed to all have negative answers. So this makes the problem significantly difficult because not only does the network now have to find the answer, but it also has to know when the answer is not actually in the data. Um, and so this area has been an area of very competitive research. A number of uh, NLP researchers in Asia are going after this, as well as the Google team. Um, and so this is the leaderboard for the squad 2.0. Um, the, the crucial thing to note about this leaderboard is that each of these entries has the word BERT up here. So BERT is a new NLP model that came out last fall. And so I'm now I'm going to spend a little bit of time breaking that down. But as of today, or last week or two, these models are starting to approach human level performance in this field. And I think they're going to rapidly improve from here. Um, the, the first important concept you should know is this idea of this transformer model. I think of this conceptually as taking the seek to seek model from before and basically making like a formal version of it, whereby you can basically take any input data, you know, any combination of input data, and then you can uh, map them together using roughly the same concepts, but uh, using much more CPU cycles, but you also get much uh, better results. Uh, a Uh, the second important concept then to add on top is this concept of transfer learning or pre-training as it's sometimes referred to. Um, this is a very common technique in the computer vision community, but historically it's not been very popular within the realm of NLP. But basically we can take a network, train it on one problem. Um, in computer vision, we train it on ImageNet and then we apply it to a different problem, say recognizing people's faces. And so this works very well in computer vision, but um, there's not been a lot of success for applying to NLP until la late last, or sorry, middle of last year when the ULM fit paper came out. Uh, so this is Jeremy Howard uh, with the Fast AI. Uh, they did this paper where they trained a three-layer three uh, LSTM model on the Wikipedia data set, a full-blown Wikipedia data set. And then they were able to, if you look at this uh, 
C part of this slide, they're able to unfreeze the final layer and then retrain it on, um, retrain it or fine tune it as it's called on a different problem and produce uh, state of the art results um, in this field. So this paper came out and it generated a lot of attention. And so as a result then, uh, the Google team basically uh, took this idea and ran with it and produced what's the BERT model. So the BERT model uses a bi-directional transformer model. Um, this can sort of be thought of conceptually as being similar to the bi-directional LSTM, but instead replacing the LSTM modules with transformer modules. Um, there's a couple other variants of this out here. This is showing them up here. Uh, the ELMO model sort of has two LSTM networks that are overlaid, but they don't technically talk to each other. Uh, Open APIs, uh, sorry, Open AI's GPT model is using a uh, directional graph. It always goes to the right. Uh, there's actually some interesting properties with this because you can make it larger. But uh, basically, Burton uses a large collection of these attention layers and a large collection of transformer heads in order to produce state-of-the-art uh, results for doing NLP tests, um, as well as being trained on Wikipedia for, to start with. So this is significantly computationally expensive to build this model, although there's been some recent progress in that area as well. But um, what we'll do now is look at one more demo, and then we'll see if our QA net has had any luck. So, okay. Okay. so first, let's look at our QA net. Uh, Still running, it looks like. Oops. All right, we'll give this one a second here. Um, so there's this uh, company called Hugging Face that develops AI chatbots. They have a very nice set of uh, demonstration Python, or sorry, PyTorch code for running uh, a handful of different uh, NLP models that you can download. Um, so what I have here is uh, their BERT model running in a virtual machine. And then we'll just fire it off and we're going to retrain it on the squad data set um, in the cloud using a T4. So we'll give this a second or two to get going here. Okay, so it's running here. Um, it'll take about two hours to do each iteration, as we'll see here. And then we run it for two iterations over the data set, or two, two epochs rather. Uh, so this particular run will take about four hours to run. Now let's go back to the QA net real fast. Okay, here we go. Uh, So, um, so here's our QA net results from running for a little bit. Uh, we've evaluated to an F1 score of 0.76, and we've run through approximately 20,000 global steps. Um, what this means is that actually it's gone through the probably the equivalent of three to four um, epochs of the uh, other DOM pinch models. But basically we train from zero up to 0.76 F1 in 23 minus 12 things. So a little over 10 minutes. And uh, this is, um, we'll say even faster than the current uh, 
number one leader on the Don Bench uh, leaderboard here. So basically then to wrap it up, um, oops, sorry, okay, um, to wrap this up, um, I'll leave you with three different ways to tackle the squad problem. Um, the first one is the retrain the BERT. Uh, this will get up to an 88% F1 accuracy, which is better than any of the models I've shown you before, and can be done in about four hours on T4, which means that it'll cost you about $5 to run. Um, the second one method I'll leave you with is this QA net uh, running on a TPU2, which will get you to a 0.75 F1 score in somewhere around 10 minutes. So that's uh, twice as fast as the current leader on the leaderboard. Uh, for simplicity, I still think the best approach is this DRQA model. Uh, I worked with, well, Runke Yang wrote the original model and I modified it slightly in order to produce these Don Bench results. But I would highly check, I would highly suggest that you check out his work. And then the future stuff to be looking at, um, Transformer XL came out recently. This is a larger version of the uh, Transformer model which has uh, Google has worked on scaling it up to train on larger and larger clusters. And then OpenAI has released GPT, and recently GPT-2. Um, these are also very interesting NLP models that you should look at. And then finally, um, uh, Don Bench. Um, there's this other competition out there called MLPerf, which I think is worth investigating if you're interested in uh, doing these sort of benchmarking uh, training results sort of things. So um, there you go. And uh, thank you all for coming. Okay, thanks a lot. Yes, any questions for, for yep. Robo Brett? Brad, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Any question? Uh, did you re-implement all these models or are there open source repos for all of them that you just used or a mix of both? Okay. Um, this is the DRQA model right here. Um, you can download it and get it here. Uh, QANet is part of Google's two PU examples. Um, I'm just running this one, literally this whole demo right here. I modified this five to be a one just in order to make sure it got the correct, uh, it, it stopped at the right spot for the demo. Um, sorry, uh, here's the actual uh, squad uh, leaderboard. If you're interested in just keeping track of where the current state of the art is in this field. Um, here's the hugging face PyTorch pre-trained BERT. They have other models in this repo as well, but here's the actual squad code that I just ran. And, uh, and then everything I'm doing right here is just being done on a collection of uh, virtual machines in the Google Cloud Platform, uh, plus one TPU way over here, so. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, man, thanks for staying up. It's two hours ahead. Okay. Yeah, it's 1028. Um, I don't know if anybody's kept an uh, eye on the Blues game, but that's what I'm supposed to be watching right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man, thanks a lot. All right. Thank you very much for your time. See you soon. Thanks for coming, everyone.